Hey, welcome everybody joining on YouTube. This is our live conversations Q and A with Pastor Jeff. Uh, this is exciting. This is different for us because yeah. um, it, one, it's live, and we're also in the worship center, so it's a bit different. Yeah. Um, but I'm really excited. Uh, we... I'm excited too, unless my wife was watching. Then I'm <laughs> yeah, be yeah. in big trouble. Then, then you're a little some nervous. Of these questions. The way they... <laughs> I'm sure she's watching at home right now, thinking I'm watching you. Yes, I'm, yeah, yeah. I've got my eyes on you. She has her notepad. She's taking notes. <laughs> yeah, she's taking notes. <laughs> That is funny. Um, well, yeah, we concluding with um, how to fix your marriage series. Uh, Pastor Basically. Jeff has talked um, a lot about it, but we also know that there are questions that you probably didn't touch on or just elaborate more on. And so, honestly, what this layout of tonight is, is I, I received a bunch of questions from everybody who uh, submitted them. And then as well, during this live, I want to encourage you, if you hear a question that, that, or if you haven't heard a question that you'd want to hear, write it in the chat. We have some people that are moderating it, and they'll send it to me by the end of this, and I will be able to ask Pastor Jeff that. And yeah, so we're just going to keep going. I'm going to keep asking you questions, trying to keep you on time, but Yeah, we'll it's see. interesting how, how many questions this uh, topic has drawn. I actually yeah. I just got back from a, a few days where I was with a few families, and the whole yeah. thing, the whole time we're away, that's question, awesome. but you haven't addressed this, or you haven't addressed that, and that's yeah. the trouble with every series. Correct, of course. Tons of questions that you can't get to, mm -hmm. so here we go. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited. So yeah, if you have those questions, throw them in the chat. Um, I do want to say some of these questions uh, um, can be very, uh, I guess you'd say, explicit, a little bit sure. vulnerable. Sure. Um, so if you're watching with your family or with some littles um, and you just want to protect their ears and they're just not ready to hear this this level of conversation yet, um, I highly suggest either stop now or watch later, um, figure that out. But just wanted to put that viewer discretion um, yeah. as we should. But I, I want to start off, we'll start with... Um, some simple questions. Yeah. Um, actually, I've always wanted to know this. How old were you and Robin when you guys got married? Yeah, well, I had just uh, finished, completed my uh, junior year of college, so mm -hmm. I would have been 22 years old. Okay, yeah, yeah. Robin, 23, okay. when we yeah. were married. We met when we were in our, uh, I guess, you know, in our teens, 19. Yeah. When we yeah, met, yeah. We, we dated three, almost four years before uh that we decided to marry. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And this actually helps with the with the first question that I really want to get to. Somebody said, can you meet the one at the wrong time because you are not fully healed from your past trauma? And is this uh, repairable with time and healing? Uh, pretty much, can I work on myself? But if I'm working on myself and I meet the one, but I feel I don't feel ready, what, what do I do? Like, wh what's the right steps to take? Yeah, you know, first of all, that assumes that there's only one. Mm. And uh, if, you know, if I meet the one, the, the one that uh, I'm supposed to marry, my soulmate, whoever, but I'm not ready yet, so I got to go work on myself. And by the time I do and get myself healed of, of, of past hurts that uh, I've missed the boat, it doesn't really work like that. Now, there mm. are times, I, I do believe that there are times when God decides, I'm going to put these two together. Mm. And I believe that more often than not, it's for ministry purposes. Huh. You know, I believe that uh, God calls a man like Billy Graham. Yeah. You know, somebody asked Billy Graham once, you know, why you? Why did God <laughs> call you? And Billy said, I have no idea. It's the first question I'm going to ask him. <laughs> but I do, but I also think that uh, there are there are many um, relationships that can work uh, in marriage. Mm -hmm. You're going to meet uh, a few people along the way. Mm. that would would be a sufficient or good partner for you. Yeah. And that's why I think that it's important to have those accountability partners around you yeah. where they can ask the right questions to get you mm. to think more objectively than subjectively. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, you know, you, you may not be in a good place uh, to, to marry because you're still working on some past wounds. Yeah. Uh, you need to be in a good place where where you are ready to be married before you worry about jumping in with somebody because that mm. that's the one that's the one so i've got to rush up now yeah. i gotta hurry up and get healed so i can be ready for marriage it doesn't work like that right you right. just you do you know you let god do his work on you and you'll know when you're ready yeah. and when you're ready then you know I, I believe that as you pray god can send you the mm. one to you for yeah. that season where mm. you are right here right now yeah yeah that makes me think of just flipping the whole perception of the one like no no god has to i always hear it I, we might have touched on this before but i've always seen videos or seen so many people 
that are like, oh, I can't wait until God taps me on the shoulder and says, yeah. there she is, or yeah. there he is. Um, and then with that perception, we think, oh, I have to be ready. So then if that person does happen to, to show up, then I'm too, I'm too uh, I guess you could say insecure yeah. because you're like, well, I'm not ready. And, and now I have to pass up on this. Well, it's interesting. You know, you, you don't want to get too deeply theological on this, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is God has complete foreknowledge of every event in the future. So <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. going to know when you're ready. Right, yeah, yeah. So the one wouldn't come until he knows you're ready. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. you can go round and round with that. Correct. The yeah. best thing to do is in our understanding of time and space, yeah. just get yourself ready and, and then pray. Yeah. When, pray that God would send you the person that, uh, that would be good for you, you good for mm -hmm. them, that would make a good match. Yeah, definitely. And with that, when you do find that person or when that, when that actually does happen, um, how do you, this is the next question, it says when you, when you are dating but you're not yet in the, in the full covenant, so how does the man learn to lead and take care of his girlfriend so he can prepare himself to be a godly husband? Yeah, well, when you're in the dating relationship, you don't have that responsibility yet. Mm. Uh, that's the, the, you're, you're dating. You're, you're, you're not her spiritual leader. Yeah. However, uh, if I were a young lady, I would be looking for habits in the young mm. man. And if I were a young man, I would be looking for habits in the young lady. Mm -hmm. Habits like a devotional life, a prayer life, yeah. how they handle difficult situations, how they handle their temper, how they handle moments of temptation. All of those are good signs of spiritual maturity. And nobody's perfect in this. I hope I haven't uh, communicated that, oh, if you've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend, that unless they're absolutely super spiritual and perfect, run away from them. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. That's not what I mean at all. But you should see that the trajectory should be moving toward God, not away. Mm -hmm, so right. if they have no interest in godly things, you'll know he's not going to be able to lead you spiritually, and she's not going to be able to... to to spiritually encourage you in your pursuits as well. There's mutual submissions. There's yeah, a sense yeah, of yeah. there's a sense of mutual leading and encouraging each other yeah. in your pursuit of Christ. Right. Yeah, totally. Um, and even within that, when when you do find that and you you do see those characteristics and those self disciplines that that you see, how do you know, okay, pretty much saying like this question would be like, how would somebody all those things great wonderful so it's like okay then can we get married next week um it's like oh we've only met each other or we've only been dating for a month can can i get married next month or do i like what's that timeline even when you figure things out in the relationship what's the timeline timeline look like to be like no we should wait this long to get married and yeah. then we can get married at this time that goes back first of all that's why we started the series the way we did yeah you've got accountability people around you mm. that can advise you whether you're ready or not yeah yeah okay they can you're, you're good parents uh good life coaches good teachers mentors if you're not see the problem is if you're not in any of those relationships you're going at this alone yeah, yeah and yeah. the subjectivity the feelings take over and you're mm. you know sometimes you become incredibly irrational and you jump the gun yeah but if you have a, if you have a solid community around you this is probably one of the best arguments for being in community mm. it's why it's why we have the oikos in the book of acts the the new testament church the household yeah. where we're together where we're encouraging each other where we're we're, we're each other's accountability partners. We yeah, can say yeah. to you, you're ready, you're not ready. This is the one, this is not the one. Yeah. But part of that, after, you, after you've gotten, after you start that journey of discovery, mm -hmm. then th there will come a time in both of your lives where you come together and you say, okay, we're ready to do this. Now, here's the next question. When you enter a covenant, you have to ask the question, in my opinion, especially uh, I still maintain that the, the man is the leader of the home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's total equality in essence, yeah. but in the same way that God has ordained it that the wife would bear children and that a man cannot, mm -hmm. that, a, that the husband is the leader, servant mm -hmm. leader, but he's the leader of the home. So the first question he has to ask is, if I'm going to enter into a physical covenant with this woman, am I also able to enter into an economic covenant. Mm. In other words, can I take care of this person economically, physically, emotionally, mm. everything? So once you, and you have, again, it's not a perfection thing. You're, you, right, you know, right. you're going to make mistakes. You're human along the way. But as long as you understand that once you enter the covenant, these are your responsibilities. And are you able at this time mm -hmm. to fulfill your covenant? So for instance, if I'm a mess uh, emotionally, 
I may not be ready for marriage. I may be ready physically. I may even be ready economically. Mm -hmm. But emotionally, I am not there. There's too much trauma. There's too many things. And when you marry thinking it's going to fix you, Mm -hmm. that's when the problems begin. So that's why counseling, that's why Mm -hmm. accountability, all of those things are important. And when you've worked on those things, you'll come to a a conclusion with the help of your accountability, your community group. You'll come to the conclusion now is the time. Right, right, yeah. And with that... That doesn't only apply to just young married couples or even dating in in the young age, that this actually applies to all ages. And so speaking to people, let's say, in their uh, late 30s, mid 40s who are still single, um, how like does their desire for marriage go away? Does it does when they're stepping into singleness? Is it almost like, okay, this is just not for me? At, at what place do they understand or yeah. seek after God after that? For a lot of men and women who remain single up into their 20s and early 30s, uh, it, it, at some point they began to develop patterns in their own lives mm-hmm. that, okay, uh, this is where I am at this point in my life. Most young Christian men and women will actually lean into their relationship with God mm-hmm. and will become, become so emotionally and spiritually healthy because yeah. they've had to, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. you know, we always say that you, you grow the most when the rugs pulled out from under you. Yeah. So if you're a, if you're a young man, a young woman, you really want to be married, but, but yeah. that, that opportunity has not presented itself yet. Yeah. You tend to lean into God. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. at that point, actually, believe it or not, you are much wiser the older yeah. you get in making the decision of who you will choose. Yeah. The reality is there are some people, there's no doubt, there are mm-hmm. some people who are destined to live a life of singleness. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a call of God uh, that he's got other plans for you and uh, being married would distract those specific plans. And somebody mm-hmm. might say, well, wait a minute, but the Bible said it's not good for man to be alone. Yes, the Bible does say that it is better mm-hmm. on one hand, if you're talking about um, companionship, On one hand, it is, of course, better to be married. On the other hand, Paul is very clear. He says, I wish that all of you were as I am. (laughs) And on the other hand, spiritually speaking and accomplishing much for the Lord, especially if he's calling you to do dramatic things in the world, then in some ways marriage and children will what? Will restrict you from things you can and cannot do. You know, I've got a great example of that in my own life right now. My daughter, she's getting close to 30. She's very independent. She feels that God has called her to a very difficult place to do ministry. Mm-hmm. And she's a beautiful young girl, but right now uh, she's not married. And I think a large part of that is because God has said, you know what, the, when the time comes, I'll make sure you're ready. But right now, if you were married, if you had children, you wouldn't be able to do, and she wouldn't be able to do what you're doing right now. So mm-hmm. you, it, there's a point where you have to really trust in a sovereign God. Yeah. And every he, he doesn't have the same plan for everyone's life. Mm-hmm. So you've got to ask God what his plan is for your life and then continue to seek that and trust him. Yeah, yeah. And for those that have sought after that and are single in that, do they fear or do they struggle with judgment from God because of that? Because they chose a life of singleness or because they're seeing, okay, well, God's calling me to this. This is one of the questions that somebody had was that. I think 30, 40 years ago, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's a different world now. I think mm-hmm. when someone chooses to be single or when someone is single, I, I don't think the judgment is there anymore. Why mm-hmm. aren't you married? Why don't you have a boyfriend? Well, because I've got to, I'm in a different phase of my life. Yeah. I think it's different now than it was yeah. 20, 30 years ago. Is it completely gone? Of course not. Mm-hmm. Sometimes when you look at someone uh, that's in their early 30s and they're not married, you're thinking, okay, what's going on? You know. Right, and the right, first right. thing that people jump to, even in the Christian circles, is, well, are you are you are you lesbian or are you gay? Hmm. That's the first, unfortunately, that's the first judgment yeah. call that happens, which is totally unfair. Yeah. The second thing is, that, well, maybe you're too hard to live with, or maybe you've got uh, habits in your life. Like there's or, something wrong with yeah. you here. So, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, that, 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 it'd be crazy to think that still doesn't happen, but that's why it's important that you lean in your relationship to God. Mm-hmm. And when you're leaning in your relationship to God, I'm telling you, the more you do that, you won't care about what other people think anyway. It doesn't really matter what they think. Right. It only matters what God in his what he thinks about you and what his plan for your life is correct, and there's no judgment from him on that decision. No, no, of course not, like at all. Yeah. If I if I were a young man, however, let's mm-hmm. be let, get to the nitty gritty here. If mm-hmm. I'm a young man and I really desperately want to be married, yeah, that desire is there, mm-hmm. and I just haven't come across the young lady that uh, 
is interested in me in that way. Mm -hmm. That to say that that's not tough is an under <laughs> that is very Correct. difficult. Yeah. If you want to be married and you're incredibly lonely and you mm -hmm. wish you could meet the one, all I, you know, I'm not God. All I can tell you to do is continue to pray that God mm -hmm. would work on you yeah. and would give would bless you with yeah. someone who would come along and love you. However, as we've said before, be careful of making marriage the ultimate savior. Right. It's not. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only one you can't live without is Christ. Now, yeah. that's, and I know some are going to say, well, yes, yeah, well, uh, well, good for you. You can say that because you're married and got two kids and now you've got <laughs> grandkids. You don't know what it's like to be single mm -hmm. and lonely and really want to be married. And you're right. I don't. The only thing I know with certainty is that God can, only God is big enough to fill uh, the voids of our lives, whatever they are. Some may mm -hmm. not be married. Some may live in poverty. Some There's always some kind of, of, of luggage, baggage that we're carrying mm -hmm. that only God can give us. the. Re it's, it's, it's a fallen world. Right. Not everything's going to work out the way we want it to. Right. Not even when you have, you know, some people are married and they wish they had never gotten married. Some people have children, they wish they had never had children. Yeah. There's no perfect case scenario. Mm -hmm. So trust God. That's why, you know, if, if, when you really trust the sovereign God, you trust mm -hmm. that he knows everything that's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And if, if you, you have to come to the point where you say, you know what, I'm not going to force this issue. Mm -hmm. God sees me. He loves me. He cares for me. He's got a plan for my life. Mm -hmm. And right now marriage is not it. And yeah. it takes trust. Yeah. That's a, I'm sure a lot of us who are hearing that, who aren't married, that's, that's a tough one to wrestle with. Yeah. But, but ultimately, Pastor Jeff, it's, what you're saying is, is that if you cultivate a life trusting God and being in his presence, you will understand that he has so much more for you than just the physical marriage or just the physical side of the desire of wanting yeah, that. Yeah, which is right? hard to do in this culture because right. we're sex crazed. I right. mean, yeah. the whole culture right now is that if, you, if you're not in some kind of relationship, then you have no value. Mm -hmm. If you're not having sex, you have no value. Mm -hmm. It, and so, well, of course, you, you're you're inundated with that in television, movies, songs, everything. So, right, right. so it covers you all the time. Yeah. But it's not the the, the cure all. Marriage, mm -hmm. relationship, sex. Mm -hmm. It is not the cure all. Uh, those are definitely gifts from God, and that's why I believe that since it is a gift mm -hmm. and no one's entitled to it, mm -hmm. because it is a gift, you keep going to the giver. Yeah. Keep seeking the giver. Keep mm -hmm. asking. Keep telling. You keep saying to God, God, this is what I want more than anything. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I had a young man come to me when I was in Savannah, Georgia. It was, yeah, I really, I could really feel for him because he, he's in his, he was mid thirties and he wanted to be married so badly. Mm -hmm. And he prayed to, he said, I prayed to God, God, I really want to be married. So if you don't want me to be married, take away the desire. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with that is that being, having the desire to be married is, as, as much a part of being human than anything else. I mean, it, it, it's, 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 you're asking God to take away a desire that is ipso facto part of being human. Yeah. That's not the way it works. Yeah. Uh, what God will help you do is point your desire towards something bigger and mm -hmm. stronger. Right. Uh, but it means, it does mean that there are some who are living lives of quiet desperation in that loneliness. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Pastors have no, you know, no one has the answer for that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Only God knows your life and the calling on your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, those are the kind of people I, I continue to feel for and pray for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, those are all, all great, and we're going to switch it up a little bit. Yeah. I'm sure, honestly, we'll probably go back and forth yep. to different little topics um, just because we're on the topic of singleness, but what about singleness after divorce? Yeah. Um, what does that look like for a lot of people? Somebody says, is there any words of encouragement of those of us who are divorced? Um, after the series, I feel defeated, guilty, and discouraged. So how do you, how do you come from this series hearing all of this, but then also at the same time go, okay, I want to enjoy yeah. singleness, yeah. life after divorce. Well, let's make sure we understand something. Divorce happens and it's not mm -hmm. the unforgivable sin. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've tried to give you the questions to ask before you marry mm -hmm. and then the way to treat each other when you're married. Yeah. But the reality is nobody's perfect at this. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that second and third marriages have a in, high chance of failure. Mm -hmm. And usually because we haven't worked on anything from the first marriage. Yeah. yeah. But if I were, if I had gone through a marriage that, that, and then gone through divorce, 
I would not give up on marriage. Yeah. I would try to learn every lesson I could. I would try to glean more wisdom and knowledge from the scriptures. I would involve myself in community with people around me, and I would start looking again for the person that I could grow old with. Yeah. So you shouldn't give up on marriage. You shouldn't give up on, on uh, living your life with someone, but you, you need to be wise now. You need to pray that God would guide and lead you and learn, ask God to show you the, uh, to learn from the mistakes that you've made in the past so that you don't repeat them. Uh, what I see too often is that a, a Christian woman or a Christian man who's been through marriage and divorce will make the same mistakes because they're so desperate to not be alone. Uh, and they'll even lie to themselves and say, well, well, he's a believer. I met him at church. Like I said, no, there's no spiritual habits in his life. Mm. Or she's, a, she's, you know, she's committed to Jesus. And you start, lie. that's why unless you have the objectivity of, of community, unless you live in community mm. with other Christ followers, man, you're not going to listen to them. This, Drew, this happens all the time. Mm. It's happened in my ministry here where there will be someone that will be in our group and they'll be single and, They'll say all the right things. And we're talking about older single. We're talking about 45, yeah. 50 years old. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the line, you know, they really want to meet somebody. They meet somebody. Mm -hmm. The person's not a Christian. And suddenly they disappear. Mm -hmm. They disappear from church and they disappear from the group. Yeah. Because they know the group nor the church will approve. Not that they would ostracize them or put them out. Right. It's just that they know their friends would tell them this is not the way to go. But mm -hmm. they, want, they fear loneliness more than they fear God. Mm -hmm. And they are terrified of going mm -hmm. through life alone, that they start making another bad decision happens, and then they go ahead and they continue the relationship. They end up getting married, and five years later, they end up right back to where they were in the mm -hmm. beginning. And it's a sad, it's a sad state of affairs. Right, so right. don't be depressed. Don't don't beat yourself up. God is a mm -hmm. gracious, merciful God. So the first time around, you blew it. Okay, <laughs> marriage bond has been broken. Now yeah. ask God to give you the wisdom as you seek to be married. Yeah. And to live life with somebody that shares a, this common interest and passion. Yeah, yeah. I, there was another question, too, kind of on that same uh, vein of that. It's like, oh, we heard you just say, you know, your second, your third marriage is usually or statistically it, it, they end up uh, um, ending. And so for somebody who's listening to this that is in their second marriage, um, I just would like clarify even more. We're, you're not saying that it is destined to no, end. Not at no, all. not not one bit. No, the reason the stats are so bad is because you don't learn the lessons, but there are some people Correct. obviously who do. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I've, uh, I've got at least three friends who are in second marriages that are doing mm -hmm. extremely well. Right, right, right. Also have friends that have been through three marriages <laughs> that, you know, so it just, it just depends on where you are. Yeah. Correct. And he, listen, Drew, even if you've been through three marriages, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, learn. Yeah. yeah a lot, yeah. you know, Sometimes you, you go into the first marriage, you're not even a believer, mm. and things fall apart. Yeah. And then you, you go into a second marriage, and somewhere in the second marriage, you start to find Jesus. And then you go mm. to the third marriage. Now, oh, see, so all the, thing, all the mistakes you've made, now mm. they're, they're coming to reality, and now you're actually a better candidate. Right. right, right. <laughs> because you're much wiser. Yeah, that, yeah. I don't, but that doesn't mean you should go out and get divorced four or five times so you'll be a better candidate. Correct, yes. Don't exactly. be depressed at all. I mean, yeah. my goodness, that's the, that's the beauty of the grace and the love and the mercy of God. I'm just trying to encourage us to get it right the first time so we don't have to go through the pain and heartbreak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the friends that I have that have been through divorce, it is painful. And they go through the wounds for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something you deal with. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, this next uh, question, kind of talking about before all of that, the engagement side of things. And so um, this person asked, says, what do you recommend the husband or the fiance to do when he has a either a, a manipulative side of a parent um, who tries to control the family unit? Like what what is the husband's responsibility in that? Or what is even the fiance's resp responsibility in that? I think it's interesting that the language used from the get-go in marriage in Genesis is leave and cleave. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I first read, oh, leave what? You know, <laughs> leave and cleave. Well, the point is that when two people become one in the marriage, that is your family now. Now, you still mm -hmm. have extended family. Yeah. But that your first responsibility now is no longer to, we're told to honor your mother and father. Yeah. When you're married, you leave that and mm -hmm. you cleave to your spouse. So you're, you're, you may honor them in a sense of respecting, but 
the final word now is not with your mom and dad, it's with your husband and yeah. wife. Mm-hmm. If, and I've, I've said numerous times that you will have parents who, who don't understand that. Good godly parents encourage both the husband and the wife in their love for each other and to mm-hmm. put each other first above and beyond everything else. Yeah. And when a mother or a father uh, uh, belittles or manipulates or tries to coerce the family into doing what they want them to do, mm-hmm. that's when you withdraw. Yeah. You, you're patient and you give a lot of grace, mm-hmm. but a, a husband who will not protect his wife from the mother-in-law mm. is not do, fulfilling his role as a godly man. Mm. And, a, and a wife who expects her husband to do everything that her father or mother requires him to mm. do is not respecting the headship, the leadership yeah. of the husband. So it's leave and cleave to one another and to protect yeah. each other and the family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really good. And to follow along with that, this question kind of goes into that as how do you move forward in restoring a broken relationship with in-laws slash parents who have been difficult or unwilling to find resolution in the beginning of the marriage? Yeah, I think it's important that as Christians, we always seek forgiveness and reconciliation mm-hmm. with all people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, until you're able to reconcile Mm-hmm. with the parents. You don't subject your spouse or your children to that kind of atmosphere. Mm-hmm. So in other words, you don't keep coming over, you don't keep uh, putting yourself in a situation where the, the wounds reopen. Yeah, so let's yeah. say let's say you've got let's say you've got parents who who from the get go did not agree with the did, did not think you married the right person. Mm-hmm. And they they've not yet accepted that. And when you're around each other, you can feel that tension and stress. Mm-hmm. Well, that's when the husband without the wife, goes to his family and says, okay, we got to talk. Yeah. Mom, dad, I love you. I love my wife first and foremost. I need you to love her, to accept her, and mm-hmm. to treat, you, treat her as your own. And if you can't do that, then we can't be around you. Yeah. It's that important. Mm-hmm. Your allegiance is to your wife. Your allegiance is to your husband, not to your right. mother or father. Yeah, that's... Well, that seems tough, though. It is tough. <laughs> it is tough, but there, there's no other way. There's just right. no other way. Right, right, right. There has to be s- some line, right, that you have to draw, some some boundary that you have to put in place that shows that you are willing to continue to grow in this marriage. Um, and sometimes th- the other side is they just won't or or yeah. they finally will eventually. I mean, obviously, that's where prayer comes in, right? Because I've heard of so many couples who've had that start um, in their marriage, early in their marriage, and then years, years later, there's, a, there's restoration and yeah. reconciliation with And with we need parents. to say that the best case scenario mm. always is for good relationship with in-laws, yeah. with grandma, grandpa, mm. the extended family, the best case scenario. So if I were in a position, I would do everything within my power for restoration. Mm-hmm. But if the time came where it was not possible, even Paul said, where it's possible, be at peace with everyone. Mm-hmm. I would try that as far and as long as I could until it had diminishing returns for my spouse or my children. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. And then um, this next question kind of, I think, goes a little bit deeper, especially with the person. It says, can childhood trauma affect your relationships and marriage? Um, and it says, as a person who grew up with bad examples of marriage, a cheating, lying, abuse, how do I stop expecting those things to happen in my marriage, even though my husband has never once done any of those things to me? Yeah. Uh, I would say that the number one impact on the, on the way you will relate to your husband or your wife and your children is your parents. Mm, mm. And so counseling is a must Yeah, to deal honestly with uh, the things that are happening in your life. As a matter of fact, especially when it comes, believe it or not, especially when it comes to the children. So, mm-hmm. So you're going to relate to your spouse usually the opposite way hmm. in the beginning. Mm. So in the beginning, you're going to realize all the things your parents did you don't like. So you're going to try hard in the beginning to be opposite. Mm. Now, as you relax, you'll find yourself, it happens to all of us, you're becoming more and more like your parents. Yeah. So that's why there are times for counseling. That's why we talked about date night, talk, conversation. But the 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 greater uh, danger, in my view, after counseling for 40 years has to do with your kids. Mm-hmm. You're going to tend to relate to your children 
180 degrees in the opposite direction of the way your parents related to you if you didn't like it. Hmm. And what that means is you go too far the other way. Mm -hmm. So let's say, let's say I have a, a domineering father. Yeah. Typically, that means, I mean, if he, if he was overboard, not, a, mm -hmm. not just a strong father. Yeah. If a strong father is good, but if I had a domineering, just hurtful, uh, just, you know, the law is laid down and there's no grace whatsoever. Mm -hmm. What I tend to do when I become a parent is set no boundaries. Mm -hmm. No boundaries at all. Mm -hmm. Well, both, both are wrong. Bo both will, will not achieve the desired outcome. Yeah. And so you have to be careful of, of, of the disdain you have for the way your parents raised you. Right. And then you have to be careful of the disdain that, that, and how they related to each other mm -hmm. that you don't go and relate to your husband so far the opposite direction yeah. that it has negative impact. And then as you grow older, the temptation is going to be to move, believe it or not, back yeah. to the example that you had in mom and dad. Now, that happens to everyone to a degree, okay? No doubt yeah. about it. We come mm -hmm. together as two flawed people. Yeah. So to think that we're going to come together and we've got all our issues sorted is ridiculous. That's why a good marriage will visit these things. We'll, we'll do counseling together when trouble, you know, even do premarital counseling and be yeah. serious about premarital counseling. I'll tell you what, if you can solve a lot of, you can solve a lot of these problems before the marriage even takes place, right. which is why I'm a big fan of long dating periods. Because hmm. if you, if you get serious about marriage counseling, you go to a good counselor. Yeah. Okay. They will walk you through all of these steps and you will go into the marriage eyes wide open about, about problem areas because mm -hmm. we all have them. And then when the problem areas appear, you will have already determined how you're going to approach them. Yeah. Whether it's conflict resolution or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I still go back. Sometimes, you know, Drew, you don't even need a counselor. You just need a good accountability group. Huh. Yeah. And to talk to people who've experienced marriage already to let right. you know what's going to happen. You know, here I am, just quickly, <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be 60 this year. And I've got a, a group of friends that we go on vacation with. Yeah. So there are six total of us. We're all married, obviously. And a couple of years ago, I made a statement about marriage. And the other two looked at me like, are you crazy? What do you mean? That's not how that works. And it was amazing. The So here's the pastor, and I'm listening. Mm -hmm. You know, So in that accountability, I realized, man, I've been wrong about this. In this one area here, yeah. I've been wrong. I, I need to adjust. Mm -hmm. I need, you know, and it was, it was helpful. Yeah. And uh, it, 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 incur it, it, it improved the marriage. Right. right you're right. always, you're always working. You're always yeah, improving. Yeah, exactly. You're always learning. Obviously seeking community within your church, having that Key. accountability Key. is huge. And probably honestly, it could save you a lot of money. Oh my goodness. <laughs> if Listen, if you're not in community, you are living as an island and yeah. you think you're right about everything. You're not getting, yeah. you know, you're not getting good mm. wisdom and advice from other people. Yeah. Uh, man. <laughs> It's, it's, it could, you're right. You save a lot of money just <laughs> yeah. by being in a good group yeah, of people. Yeah, exactly. Earlier you were talking, talking about, about um, how we kind of become our parents. And I kept thinking of that. Um, I don't know if it's Geico commercial or like a progressive commercial where the guy is a coach for uh, married couples that who become their parents. <laughs> and so the whole time it's like just the younger guy who's dressing like his dad, <laughs> doing the typical things of yeah. like, oh, look at the weather today. And he's like, <laughs> nobody asked. Like, you got to stop. It just really it reminded me of that. Yeah, but do. how true it is yeah. that we really do um, have we a become tendency parents, to become yeah. our parents. Or, or the exact opposite, and both mm -hmm. are not good. Yeah, right, correct. Yeah. Um, and then it, just a... Uh, another question off of if you do seek marriage counseling, um, does it have to be from a Christian counselor? Does it, you know, because yeah. I know I've received yeah. some of those questions too yeah. from a lot of engaged couples and married couples. Man, I, I'm telling you, if you don't, if you don't uh, receive counseling from someone with a Christian worldview, mm -hmm. you're going to go down the wrong road. And that yeah. includes, that, that not only includes uh, marriage counseling, but it includes, uh, your your child raising mm. philosophy. Yeah. Remember, the secular worldview and the Christian worldview are totally opposed to each other. Mm -hmm. The secular worldview tells you that humanity is basically good, that human nature is basically good. Mm -hmm. uh, Christ would tell you that the heart of man is wicked mm -hmm. and needs renovation. Yeah. And so when you when your starting point is that men and women are basically good people, then you're going to assume that they're always going to do the right thing when they're showed the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. You're also going to assume that your children will do the right thing if you just model for them the right thing to do. Yeah, That's not how it works. <laughs> I mean, 
why do we have to tell our children to share? Yeah. Why doesn't it come naturally? Hmm. Why do they pull and tug at each other's hair and their food and their because we have a natural bent and the mothers they cringe when I say this. <laughs> we have a natural bent away from what is good and right. Hmm. Hmm. So do married couples. You have a natural bent towards self serving. You have a natural bent yeah. toward you. Mm. And that's got to change. Mm. And that's why if you go into counseling that where the worldview is that we are basically good and we, it's only a lack of education and knowledge, and if we have the right education and knowledge, we'll do the right thing, mm. you're going to go down a path that will lead to just more and more counseling with, yeah. never, with no healing. Mm -hmm. now, so, now, obviously, there's going to be some good nuggets in both worlds, of course. Yeah. Not everything that is non-Christian is bad. There's a lot of good yeah. in non-Christian thinking. I'm simply saying, ultimately, you better make sure that your counselor has a Christian worldview yeah. where they assume that we both... Mm -hmm. have hearts that need renovating. Mm -hmm. And that way the counseling will approach not you're right and he's wrong or she's right and you're wrong, that you're both wrong and you've both <laughs> got to find your way over to this. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, and you're, you're just spending a, lot, you're spending a lot of money mm -hmm. uh, for a worldview that will not take you down the right road. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And how important that is to have somebody in, in the middle also take you back to Scripture or at least take you back to what the Word of God says. Think, of, think about a parent for a moment. Mm -hmm. Make the analogy of marriage. Think about a parent who assumes that their kid will always do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Who assumes that the problem is if I just explain, let's use my, let's use my granddaughter. Yeah. If I explain to little Ada, Ada, this is the right thing to do. If I think she's always going to do it, I'm living in a dream world. <laughs> right. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that, yes, I'm going to teach you, but there's going to be discipline associated with teaching. I'm not, mm. I'm not talking about whacking her over the head now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm simply saying here is cause and effect. Mm. When you do these things, there's a reward. When you, when you disobey these things, mm. this is what happens. These are yeah. the ramifications. Well, that's because I have a worldview that says that you have a bent toward to do not mm. the right thing, but the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, you'll do some things right, but when you come to a matter of temptation, you're not always going to do the right thing. Yeah. So how do I motivate you to continue to do what is good and what is right? Yeah. Yeah. And so much of so much of child raising right now, the books that our next generation is reading, yeah. the advice that they're getting off Google or YouTube or whatever is not from a Christian worldview. Correct. It's from a totally secular humanistic worldview that assumes every child is perfectly fine and good. <laughs> and you're in for a rude awakening. Right, exactly. Um want to get to the next question yeah, cuz that no that was that Getting was into really the next good. series already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um but this honestly kind of goes into it because this person says uh, my husband won't lead our family as God has designed. He doesn't read the Bible, spends most of his time on his phone with social media or plays video games. How can the purpose of marriage, the deep correct character of change, they say, uh, be fulfilled if he won't submit to God? Mm. Well, first of all, uh, if both are Christ followers mm -hmm. and he's not fulfilling his role as the spiritual leader of the home, then the only recourse she really has is prayer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, yeah. like, that's where the for better, for worse came in, mm -hmm. right? You said you married this man. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, sickness and health. This is your husband. He's not living up uh, to what he should be doing. Mm -hmm. True. So you've got you 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 pray that God would do whatever's necessary, mm -hmm. and of course, like we said, God's not going to violate his freedom to choose. Right. right but right. pray that God would orchestrate events in his life to wake him up to his responsibility to spiritually lead the family. In the meantime, mm -hmm. do not nag. <laughs> Do not remind him of his failures every single mm. day. Do not yeah. do that. That'll just push him farther and farther away. Pray, model for him what that looks like as a mm. wife. Model mm. for him what that looks like. You're reading your Bible. You're praying. Yeah. If you ask your husband, but ask him humbly, say, you know, honey, is it possible that we could do something together? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, could we pray together? Could we read scripture together? Yeah. It could be as he a loner. Mm. Some men are spiritual, but they're spiritual loners. Mm. Their time with God is, is they're not good in groups. Mm -hmm. it, they're better in isolation. Yeah. Uh, so is, what do you tell, just write out what you need from him, but you've mm. got to, you've got to do it in such a way, because if you don't communicate with him, then you can't hold him responsible. Mm -hmm. Do it in such a way as to appeal, not, not, 
put him in a position to where you're just you're just dropping the hammer on him. So, right, right, so right. Write, write a love note to him. Honey, I love you. You're my husband. You'll yeah. always be my yeah. husband. I will never leave you. Yeah. We are together. You know, can I, can I ask you to consider these things mm. for me? Mm. And that's where the date night comes in. Right. To where you, where you ask those questions. What right. are you not getting from me that you need? Now, if here's a man who has totally uh, shut you out, okay? So there's no time. I mean, you're living, you're in the same house, but you're, some men will do this. They just check out completely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They go to work. They come home. They don't talk to you. They don't talk to the kids. Mm-hmm. They don't, they're just there. They, they sleep. They go to work the next day. They go hang out with their friends. Mm-hmm. This is a person who's totally disconnected from you. Yeah. And so this is where you've got to be very honest and say, hey, this is not a marriage. We're two people living in the same house, but there's no relationship here. We, we, we don't. We're not together physically. We're not together intimately. We're not together spiritually. What's going on here? Mm-hmm. And this is where you have to say, look, we, we've got to go to counseling because this is not a marriage. Mm-hmm. Now, when you have a partner refusing to do that, yeah, that's a, that, that to me is the most difficult marriage to be in. Yeah. And you say, well, what do I do, Pastor Jeff? Well, I think sometimes you separate. Now, what, this is what we haven't talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes the man or the wife has to be you got to wake up. Yeah. And if you've gone to your husband or you've gone to your wife and you've done this numerous times and now you're into years where there's, this is no marriage, mm-hmm. then sometimes you, you say you, you separate. You don't divorce. You simply separate. You go back home and live with the parents. You go, mm-hmm. but you, okay, some people are going to say, well, hold on a minute. Economically, I can't do that. Then if you, economically you can't do that, then you have to stick it out. Mm. You've, you've got to, now, uh, now, unless there's, let's say there's abuse. Yeah. Is he beating on you? Is he hitting on you? You've got to get out. Mm-hmm. Right, You've got right, to go right. talk to your pastor. You've got to go talk yeah. to your group. You've got to go talk to somebody. Do not ever stay in a marriage where you, your, your life or your child's life is in danger. Yeah. If you've got an abusive husband, get out of the house. Mm-hmm. Leave. Separate mm-hmm. from them. And then tell your husband, until you get sober, until you straighten this out, until you yeah. deal with this, we're not together. Yeah. And sometimes that's a clincher that will send them over to right. finally get help. Yeah, yeah. And actually, we, we both me and you talk about that in depth, specifically with abuse um, in our week three combo. Um, and so we, we actually have a lot of questions on yeah. uh, abuse, uh, specifically that you you talked about how there's three reasons and then and then abuse was, yeah. wasn't brought up. So with, with that in, in mind, just to, to um, bring somebody's question is, uh, what does God want a married person to do when they are consistently being abused in a marriage, emotionally, physically, or even financially? Um, I think this is the bigger question. Does initiating a divorce offend or invite the judgment of God? Okay, the, the key passage here, and I really encourage couples to read 1 Corinthians 7. Read the whole chapter. Spay Pay very close attention to verse 15 through the end of the chapter. Mm. This is a key verse. This is a key passage of Scripture because it's Paul giving the church advice, the church at Corinth, on relationships. And what you learn is basically there are three reasons. There are three ways the marriage bond is broken, through death, of course, and uh, through adultery, and through an unbelieving husband or wife who leaves the marriage. Mm -hmm. In all those cases... Divorce is acceptable because the marriage bond has been broken. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, anytime the Bible permits divorce, this is important. Mm-hmm. Anytime it permits divorce, it permits remarriage. Mm-hmm. There's no occasion where it permits divorce, but then doesn't permit remarriage. Mm-hmm. So anytime you're in a situation, let's take the third one, because death is pretty easy to understand. Mm-hmm. Adultery is easy to understand. But what about when you have a husband or a wife who mm-hmm. who manipula who who who's abusive, verbally abusive, financially abusive, hides the money from you, mm-hmm. uh, sexually abusive, whatever it is? This is a case where you have a husband or a wife who's acting as. First of all, if you're a Christ follower mm-hmm. and you're doing that, what's going on? Mm-hmm. Is your husband an unbeliever? And the Bible says if the unbeliever wants to leave, let them leave. And that, what that means is if the unbeliever wants divorce, do not fight the divorce. Mm. Let the divorce occur. The marriage bond is broken, and you can mm. remarry. Mm. So are you, if you're telling me that you're in a situation where the husband is abusive, but he doesn't want divorce, 
He wants to just continue to live in this abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. That's where I go back to separation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't have to put up with this. Get yeah. out of the house or ask him to leave. Yeah. Now, if he says, I'm not going anywhere, well, that says a lot. So mm -hmm. you're, willing to, you're willing for me and the children to, without a place to live, mm -hmm. and you stay in the house. Mm -hmm. So that says a lot about what he really feels about you. There's right, no, right. there's no love there. There's no passion there. Yeah. He'd rather you be on the street than him leave. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, find a way to get out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Drew, I need to go back to this. Yeah. This is why it's so important to be in Christian community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here we go again. Yeah, yeah. Because if but you're it's in, true. if you're in Christian community with 15, 20 other Christ followers, right. you're going to find one of them that's willing to let you stay with them for Correct. a season. Correct. Yeah. That is if you've invested in community and relationship. Yeah. So let's take the two families that I know. If I, if I, if, if let's say that I lost all my, my house burned down, that I'm in financial disarray, mm -hmm. I guarantee I could go to either one of them and ask to stay with them until I can get back on my feet. And they'd say yes. Yeah. But that's only because I've invested in relationship. Mm -hmm. Right. So don't make sure you distinguish between separation and divorce mm -hmm. separation can be good because it wakes the spouse up so if you're in a if you're in an abusive relationship get out yeah ask him to leave and to sort himself out if he refuses to do that then you go live with your parents live somewhere yeah and you're still going to get the fight. You might have to go to court. You might have to get the yeah. finance. But again, a husband who listen, a husband who really loves his family is going to take care of them financially. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if he's that angry that you want to separate during this time because of the way he's treating you, then you've lost him already. Mm. You've lost yeah. him already. Yeah. So the the economic situation is a very unfortunate because typically the reason a woman with children will not leave a man, mm -hmm. separate from a husband, in order the husband can get help and then when he gets help there can be restoration. Typically what happens is there's just no financial recourse. There's no, yeah. they can't survive. Right. And I go back to this. There is a great penalty to pay when you're not in community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is one of the problems. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've got no extended family. Mm -hmm. You've got no group of Christ followers to take care of you mm -hmm. while you're in this place Yeah, to help you get back on your feet. Uh, in the state of California, uh, financial recourse is doable. It just takes time to get it done through the courts. Yeah. But I do understand that there are women... And there might even be some men. I don't think there are, but there would be women who are living in situations yeah. that are just so drastic. Yeah, right, right, right. And I just encourage all men and women to get in community. Right, hundred percent, get in community because also you never know. the The beauty of a Christ centered community is that you are not alone in your situation. They're gonna help you. You're gonna have people help you when you mm -hmm. come to these crises of Correct. your life. Yeah, exactly. And That's you're gonna Acts meet two somebody. And Acts four. Yeah. And especially you meet people who have gone through the same thing, who yeah. know what it what it's like to live um, under that and, and know exactly what to do to help get you out of it. Yeah. Um, so, of course, again, community, uh, church community, g get involved, whoever's listening and who feels like they're, they're under this right now. We have resources for you. Um, I just want to say this out the gate. You know, we have re-engage. Um, which is a wonder, wonderful program that we have here to help uh, married couples um, honestly find restoration, find healing through a lot of stuff. And so, yeah, that's definitely, I would probably go throw, throw that yeah. back. But just, just quickly, I don't know if this is one of the questions, but I yeah. know it's one of the questions of men my age. Mm -hmm. And I get questioned all the time, well, what do, you, what do you do when you're married to a woman who has no interest in sex? Yeah, that is a question. <laughs> what, that, you know, that's, that's a, what do you do? I yeah. said, well, first of all, remember what you said, for richer, for poor, for mm -hmm. better, for worse, in sickness and health. Yeah. So first of all, you, have you had a conversation? Yeah. Have you gone to counseling? Mm -hmm. Have you talked to your community? It's the same <laughs> thing every time. Yeah. But there are some men who have done that, Drew, mm -hmm. who have gone to the community, who have gone to yeah. their accountability partners, who have done counseling, and to no avail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now you've got a problem because the Bible says that your body does not belong to you. Mm -hmm neither to the wife or the husband. Right. And this is also a difficult one because I think that if a husband or a wife is not willing to improve in this area, not willing to get to the bottom of why this is happening, mm -hmm. the marriage bond will break. Mm -hmm. It will. It, it, it's just, it's a matter of time. Yeah. And uh, for, I, we have a, I have a friend who, whose wife just decided one day they'd been married, had kids, uh, actually were part of our church for many years. 
that just decided one day that she doesn't want to be with a man anymore. Mm. And what's, you know, he, it ripped him to shreds. Right. Just like that. What's he to do? Mm-hmm. You know, what's his recourse? And again, his, 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 his response should be to love mm-hmm. and to seek restoration yeah. and to seek counseling. But if you get to a point where there's no, there's, there's no going back, there's no effort in the marriage, mm-hmm. that is the ultimate question of 1 Corinthians 7. Yeah. Can the marriage, is the marriage bond broken when the unbeliever leaves and what does it mean to be an unbeliever? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, we know in the context of the Apostle Paul, it's when somebody decides, you know what, you're following Jesus. I don't want to follow Jesus. I'm, I'm divorcing you. The Bible says, let them go. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the reason it gets so convoluted sometimes is what about when, the, when the, a spouse breaks the marriage bond mm-hmm. by withholding sex? Mm-hmm. There's no intimacy. By checking out mentally, socially, mm-hmm. All those things that you committed to do in the covenant, what happens when the husband or the wife checks out of all that yeah. and just decides, I'm going to live in the same house, but there's going to be no relationship here? Yeah. What, you, that's why I say go back to accountability, go back to counseling, yeah. Yeah. go back, try everything you can for reconciliation. But let's be, let's be honest, sometimes it is not possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which, and at that point, separation occurs it, yeah. and you pray and you pray that somewhere along the line, the person will repent. Right. If the person doesn't repent, it's only a matter of time, I promise you, before the marriage bond will be broken Mm -hmm. through adultery or through some kind of immorality. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And to go off of the next question with that, um, how how many times do you forgive infidelity before walking away of the marriage? Like, what what is that line? And uh, Once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't yeah. have to, but if, if, if a husband or a wife cheats, mm-hmm. that's sexual immorality, and it's, mm-hmm. the Bible is very clear. The marriage, you broke the marriage bond. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that wound is so deep. Mm-hmm. However, some men and women find it within themselves to forgive. Right. If right. you're able to do that, good. Yeah. If you're not able to do that, that doesn't mean that you're any less or worse the person. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of people disagree with me, and there's going to be a lot of pastors right. agree. Right, right. Uh, I just think based on Scripture, <laughs> I think there's a reason. There, there was a reason that the marriage bed is sacred. When you violate that, mm. the pain, the suffering, the lack of trust, the difficulty of building trust yeah, uh, is, is, is mo- probably one of the most difficult things to do in a relationship. Right, right, yeah. So, yeah, you if, if there's infidelity, and that's why I say, when I when I hear men talk to me about pornography not being sexual immorality, mm. yes, it is. Mm. Yes, it is. You're getting something from another woman just because you're not physically in her presence. You're getting something from another woman that's not your wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. And it, you know, I think most women would say to their husbands, "Hey, you need help, and you better stop this, and you better get help." Right. But if there's a if there's an unrepentant spirit, mm-hmm. no, this is uh, I'm not hurting anybody. This, you know. Mm. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. Um, I want to I want to go back to that, but I want to go back to a, a early something you said earlier um, that you said a separation was appropriate in cases of abuse. Um, could you clarify whether divorce is also appropriate in those cases if there is no resolution? Uh, divorce again. Let me if I, if I stay if I let the Bible de- determine yeah. this, and I need to. Mm-hmm. Divorce is for sexual immorality, mm-hmm. for death. Well, that's not divorce. That's remarriage. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. divorce is for sexual immorality or if the husband, the unbelieving husband leaves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Separation, however, mm-hmm. I think separation should happen in cases of abuse. Mm-hmm. And it's been my experience after the separation happens, sexual immorality follows quickly. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. It ha- I, 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 don't, I don't know of a case where it hasn't followed. Yeah. Uh-huh. As soon as the separation happens... The spouse cheats, mm-hmm. right, 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 and and I'm not saying we'll separate so that you'll have a so, so you'll you have can... a, a legal right. No, <laughs> no, separation is in hopes of restoration, mm-hmm. but there's usually no middle ground. Mm-hmm. When you separate, there's either restoration that happens through counseling, or yeah. there's the breaking of the marriage bond. Right, right, right. But if the marriage bond, let's all right, let's go, let's go theory wise. Okay. In theory wise, let's say that you separate, and the husband or the wife, who whichever one left, is trying to work on themselves. But do, but remains faithful. Mm-hmm. Nope, mm-hmm. nope. You're still married. Yeah, marriage bond has not been broken. Right, right. Yep. Um. So okay, with that, 
all of <laughs> all of yeah. that um is in in that instance is self-pleasuring a sin when you are in a sexless marriage so um so here's here's a famous story that happened i actually wanted to uh, ask you about this famous pastor was in, being interviewed and was being asked about intimacy with his wife yeah. and he said that when he is traveling uh, clearly his wife is not with him often in those times and so when he's traveling he's in the hotel room all this stuff it, this is where it gets a little explicit um but he says that it's okay for Absolutely. him to I, to I, masturbate to his wife or i, I agree you do you okay 100 percent. Okay. yeah yes it would it be mind only or does it have like like with his wife yeah yeah, yeah yes yeah. with his wife fine okay okay yeah. gotcha i i would agree with that uh-huh yeah that's yeah. very interesting yep yeah, I, I would agree with that i i think uh, that there are men who can do that mm-hmm. uh, because they're so in love with their wives, and yeah. it's better that mm-hmm. not not that okay. I got to be careful. Yeah, <laughs> got to be careful there. But I think that you're you yes yeah with mm-hmm. your wife that's that's that in my uh, see this is where you w- the Bible doesn't talk about this. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm what I'm doing is I'm taking I'm extrapolating out what I believe to be the essence of the marriage bed between a man mm-hmm. and a woman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When it comes to intimacy with my wife, in any way, form, or fashion, mm-hmm. okay, uh, what happens in the in the marriage bed is between the wife and the husband. Yeah. As long as both are agreeable. Mm. So, yes, if both are agreeable yeah. that this is something that can happen uh, when the husband is traveling, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But obviously it gets tough when people who either, either have a past of infidelity or even have a past of just sexual sin or even people who have a a past with uh, like pornography addiction like it's not a free pass to think of those things no it's not so you have to clarify you better you better have to clarify that yeah exactly your mind where it should be for sure right exactly so it's always pointed towards your wife there's always a danger in it Uh uh-huh correct if you can if 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 you're able to and i think some men are you know i've met Mm. men that are able to do that and women that are able to do that so yeah yeah Mm. That's good. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. A, that's a, been a very popular question amongst yeah. uh, the Christian worldview, and yeah. so it's good to hear your your yeah. thoughts on that um, as well. Um, okay, so I see we don't have much time, so I'm gonna just sure. rattle off some some questions. Um, this question we just got in says, "Wife and I have been struggling lately. I believe we love each other and want it to work, but infidelity is part of our past, and neither know how to get past it." Yeah. Suggestions. Well, first of all. Let's go back yeah. to what I said before. Mm-hmm. That's it's so difficult. Mm-hmm. It's not easy for anyone. However, if you've got two people who want to get past yeah. it, you can. Yeah. But you're gonna have to really do the hard work of good Christian counseling worldview. Can I just go ahead since we're here? Yeah. Let me just we, we have in we are blessed in Southern California because in Pasadena, we have what is called the Prater Group. Hmm. Uh P-R-A-D-E-R, the Prater mm-hmm. Group. This is a group of counselors that come out of the old Fuller Seminary, okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. These are fantastic counselors. Mm. And if you, uh, if you are in a marriage where you've suffered infidelity, but you both want to make it work, spend the $85, man, and go over there and see them. Mm. They are so good, Drew. Yeah. Matter yeah, of fact, yeah. I'm speaking from experience. Mm-hmm. I've been to them. Yeah. And uh, they are superb yeah yeah, yeah. that's and awesome if you get good christian worldview counselors like this mm-hmm. man they are worth giving up coffee for three months or whatever you have to give <laughs> yeah. up to get your wife and your husband there because you can you know yeah you, that is possible it just takes hard work right right, right. hard work dedication and good for love. them yeah good for two husbands good for a husband and wife for saying you know what we, we've not been wise in this but we Correct. want to make this work good for you and you yes. can't you can get past it, but I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to take some work and right. commitment. Right. Yeah. It's going to be a, a tough road, but a, a road worth going through yeah, if absolutely. they can, if they're able to. Because to it go is true. It. And this is, I hope this is the same that everybody remembers. <laughs> it is always true that your best life is with your present spouse. Mm. It, your best life. If you can work through whatever that whatever it is, yeah. your best life is with your present spouse, not the one that is to come. Yeah, yeah. It just if you can do the work now. Yeah. Oh man, because then you solve so many issues. Yeah. Uh, without trying to do it again. Right. <laughs> and again, right. And again yeah. right. Yeah. Um, okay. Next couple of questions. Uh, somebody says, 
What advice would you give a couple that is starting a family with children from their previous relationships? I'm assuming that when you went into this relationship, you all you agreed already that Correct. you're bringing these children in. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something, Drew. That that again is a very difficult thing mm -hmm. because the children have a different mother or father, mm -hmm. and there's an allegiance to that mother or father. Yeah, you are going to have an incredibly difficult time. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to go to counseling. <laughs> you're going to have to do a lot of yeah, it. Yeah, It's just, that's, there's no easy answer mm -hmm. to that. Right, right, right. Uh, you're, you're going to have to do the hard work. You're going to yeah. have to understand that it's a different playing field for you. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, exactly. And you're going to face those issues. In, in, as a matter of fact, I, I, can I just be honest? Yeah. I, I, when a young couple comes to me and they want to get married, mm -hmm. and let's say the husband's bringing three kids in to this marriage, yeah. I usually advise them not to, no, no. Yeah. Don't, don't, no, I would advise you not to do that. Wow. But that's how hard it is. That's how difficult it is. Yeah, right. And right, then right. when they say, but no, no, we, we're in love. We, right. we know we're, okay, okay. Because then you'll see how serious they are. Mm -hmm. And if they go ahead and they say, yeah, but no, we really want, I'd say, I, I wouldn't advise it. Yeah. I'd do that two or three times, but if they are insistent, I'd say, okay, then here's the prerequisites before you get married. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that they go in with eyes wide open. Mm hmm Unfortunately, I usually get them after they've been married three or four years mm. and they brought and they didn't ask those difficult questions and now they're in the thick of it. Yeah. My answer is always going to be community and counseling. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Because it's not, there's no one, one easy answer. Yeah. Well, that's the thing with Christianity, right? It's not do it yourself Christianity. No, no, you, you have to be in community. Yep. You have to be um, with people who are like minded in Christ and who are going to help shape my, you. My bigger concern, too, just quickly, I know we're mm -hmm. almost out of time. My bigger concern right now is I look around and I see the next generation getting married and having kids. As I said before, Drew, my concern is that you're not, you're, that the husband is going into the marriage with, and he doesn't have his eyes wide open to what's going to happen to his wife when the kids come along. And the wife is not going in with eyes wide open to what's going to happen to the husband when mm -hmm. the kids come along. You cannot live two separate lives. You mm -hmm. cannot. Yeah. And you can't just be the baby daddy or the baby mama. Mm -hmm. You never stop being husband and wife, no matter yeah. what season of life you're in. Mm -hmm. So if you give all of your time to the kids, the marriage is not going to last. Mm -hmm. right. you've, got to, you've got to figure out how to juggle the kids and one another. Mm -hmm. Not it, You can't do one at the exclusion of the other. Yeah. And if you do that, you're going to pay a huge price right. six, right, seven right. years down the road. Yeah. Oh, totally. Definitely. Um, well, yeah, I feel like you keep answering questions that I haven't even uh, asked, yeah, well. <laughs> which is, I mean, obviously God and the Spirit moving, um, which is awesome. But with that, uh, how do I make my spouse a priority slash be intentional when our children are in the toddler stage and require so exactly. much? Exactly. That's exactly right. Right. All right. goes back to date night. Mm -hmm. that, to me, it's almost a cure-all. Yeah. Because if the husband knows every Thursday night, he gets you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he not only gets you for coffee, he gets intimacy with you. That's mm -hmm. your time. He's, you yeah. know what he starts to do? He starts to say, you know what? She needs my help. Mm -hmm. But I know on Thursday nights, we're going to spend time together. Yeah. But what happens is that if you don't set aside that time, he wonders, he's wondering when that time is ever going to come again. Mm -hmm. And that's when frustration happens. That's when temptation happens. Yeah. That's when trouble happens. Yeah. Just, just set aside, agree, come together mm -hmm. and agree when you're going to, we're going to be together I would, and you know, if, if it costs you a little, because they're going to say, well, what about childcare? Yeah, well, have somebody invest in your marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm telling you, yeah, if yeah. you don't do it, it's, it's not good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. That's really good stuff. Um, last few, um, and then we'll, we'll conclude. Um, how do I remain positive and encouraged when my significant other has a life changing illness? How do I do what? How do, how do I encourage, how, how do I stay positive and, and, and be encouraged or be an encourager when my significant other is, has a life-changing illness? Yeah. Women are much better at this because they're nurturing the men, obviously. <laughs> right, right. But in, in cases like this, this is, uh, this is something that can only be accomplished through prayer and the strength mm. of the Spirit. Yeah. Uh, you can do it. Mm. It can be done. And in fact... You are never more like Christ than when you're ministering to a husband or a wife who's in the middle of illness. Because yeah. you're sacrificial, you're compassionate, and you're trying to be encouraging at the same time. Yeah. However, 
you got to make sure you're getting your encouragement at the same time or the well will run dry. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're in prayer and make sure that you have a group of people who are coming around you and doing for you what you're doing mm -hmm. for your spouse. Yeah. And if you do that, you'll make it through a difficult season. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't try to do it on your own. Yeah, right, all right. Um, yeah, that's important. Um, How many times have we said community in this? <laughs> a lot. My goodness. <laughs> oh, very much so a lot. I think the theme of having a healthy marriage is to Being make sure you're community. in good and healthy community. Yeah. Um, definitely. I think, okay, so uh, two more questions. We'll do two more and then we'll, we'll okay. conclude. So the first one is uh, thoughts on birth control, navigating to when to have children. Um, I think that's a, a big question for a lot of uh, young married couples. Um, also, it's kind of births that question of, um, are, are we in control of when God tells us to have a kid or are we, are we trying to take control of that? Yeah, so just like thoughts on, on, on that realm. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think it'd be wise for the husband and wife together to pray, God, we really desire to have children. Yeah. And uh, we ask for wisdom in this. Yeah. Uh, for when the right time would be, mm -hmm. while at the same time, uh, not preventing the children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless you've already decided you don't want them mm -hmm. yet. Yeah. Now, if you've decided we don't want children yet, then uh, you're obviously using the the, uh, the birth control. Yeah. Uh, but if you say, God, we're open to having children, show us the way. Just keep living your life and doing your thing. And when the yeah. pregnancy comes, it comes. Yeah. The yeah, only yeah. time you'd use birth control, of course, is when you know now's not the time. Right. 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 But if it's God, show us when. Well, He will. If yeah. You get yeah. Pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then on the other side of that, what, what do you, what do you do if it's just been too, trying so long to have children in your marriage? Obviously that causes a lot of division within the marriage relationship. And so how do you navigate life if it's, if it's taking too long or mm. if the, that result that you want is just not there yet? Yeah, that was Robin and me. Mm -hmm. Cause we were married at 22. We kept trying, trying, trying. We didn't have our first kid till 30. Yeah. But you know, we kind of. We were good with it because mm -hmm. we kept mm -hmm. saying, God, hey, if you want us to have a baby, we're going to have a baby. If you yeah. don't, we won't. Yeah. And so the tension kind of went out. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. uh, and if I, when I noticed Robin a little frustrated, I would say, honey, remember, yeah. this is God's child. It's not ours anyway. The child's already in heaven. When mm -hmm. God decides that the child is ready, we'll have a child. And, and yeah. it just took all the pressure off. So mm -hmm. just really, you, you know, it's, it's the same thing I would say to someone who is single looking yeah. to get married. Be patient. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and, and what if, what if we never have a child? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe that's God's will for your life in this season of your life. Yeah. And then some women will feel so strongly that they want a child mm -hmm. that they'll try over, which is fine too. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, this is God laying a passion and desire in your heart to go a different route. Yeah. That's fine too. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I think you, I think you're, you don't be silly. Yeah. You know, if there are other options available, do you want a child? Ask God to give you blessings in that option. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah no, those are good. Um, there's obviously more questions yeah. that we can continue to continue on and um, ask all of those, but I think that was great, great, yeah. uh, great answers, Pastor Jeff. Obviously, there's um, a lot of people who are listening, obviously with heavy hearts within this uh, uh, realm of marriage, and um, I just want to take probably this the short amount of time, just if we could say a, a quick or long prayer. Yeah. yeah, Pastor Jeff, if you can lead that, just for let me and let me end with let me yeah, let me yeah. have the prayer, but let me say first of all. You know, to those of you who have, you've listened to this series and think, man, where was this 30 years ago? I've made every mistake in the book. Well, welcome to humanity. This is humanity. Uh, man, if we could get everything right the first time, what, what would be the use of living, right? Did we be in heaven? It'd be perfection. Don't beat yourself up too bad. Here you are now. God is a God of grace and mercy. My goodness. If you think, man, I really blew this in the past. Well, confess your sins. Confess to God, God, I didn't do the right thing. I, I didn't treat my wife the way I should have. I didn't treat my husband repent, confess, and let God separate your sins as far as the East is from the West and stop mm -hmm. beating yourself up. Move on with your life and ask God to bless you in your next relationship, okay? Yeah. Uh, if you're in a relationship now that you know is going nowhere and your life is a living hell, pray for God to give you wisdom in the next decision that you make. But whatever it is, make sure you run it by community. Get good advice from good Christian counseling with a good Christian worldview and then put those practices 
uh, form those disciplines in your life. Seek God. Practice what you learn. And I, I promise you that God will do something very unique and mm-hmm. special in your life. For those of you who are single and very frustrated, you're, you're, you're afraid, you're doubting that you're ever going to get married, be patient. Let, let God be the determining factor here. Always pray that God would show you and give you the direction that he's laid out for your life and also pray that he would give you the courage to walk mm-hmm. in that path. And trust him. Trust him. Mm-hmm. So many people get married later on in life, and then they look back and they think, oh, I got it now. I wasn't really ready. I'm ready now. Mm-hmm. But trust God in whatever that is. And if you're dating right now, <laughs> ask those questions. Be smart. It's the rest of your life. Make sure that you're asking the good questions in community. All right, let me pray for us. Yeah. Father, uh, life itself is a journey, and it's, it's filled with uh, struggles, with obstacles, with challenges. But we know we also have the power of the Holy Spirit in us who, who guides us, who gives us wisdom when we ask for it, according to James 1. And you have provided a community of believers for us that would minister to us, that would advise us, that would encourage us, that would meet the needs just as they met each other's needs in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. So, Father, I, I pray that for those who are in difficult marriages that you would guide and direct their paths, that they would have received some answers. For some, it may be necessary to separate for a time in hopes that restoration can happen in the long run. For others, it may mean coming together as husband and wife and going to counseling and making some decisions and determining that the end goal is the restoration of their relationship. And I pray that you'd remind them that direction, not intention, determines destination. Give them the direction that leads to the place uh, of a healthy and uh, loving marriage uh, that would build strong families. Mm -hmm. Father, there's a myriad of cases that we haven't gotten to, lots of Mm -hmm. questions we weren't able to answer. So I pray as each person comes to you that you would give them direction and guidance. And uh, I pray that as a church, uh, our small group leaders, our 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 teachers, our pastors, that we would be available uh, on the patio uh, on a weekend, that if someone has a question, we could coach them and teach them and encourage them that there is hope. And help us always remember that through Christ and the church, we are, he is the hope of the world. So I pray for instruction. I pray for compassion from the church. And I pray for restoration in broken relationships where it it is possible. Through Christ and in his name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Jeff. That was a great time. We hope that you enjoyed this. Um, I know there are so many more questions, uh, but I want to encourage you, if you still have those questions or if you still have anything, to actually email us at uh, info at oneandall.church. From there, we can answer all your questions. We'll receive your questions, and we just want to help you in your journey, um, either restoration between whatever you're going through, whatever the relationship status is. We have reengage. We have a care department that is for you, that wants you to succeed in every possible way that God has called you to do so. I want to encourage you, if you've enjoyed our conversations, this is what me and Pastor Jeff do. Uh, We have, it's called Conversations. And in fact, I just did one with Pastor Dave Stone, which was phenomenal. And in fact, he answered some questions um, that we received today. So I want to encourage you that will be posted up this week. And just to watch our previous ones, if you just want more content, want to go deeper within sermons, uh, follow our YouTube channel, uh, subscribe to it and watch all the things. Well, with that, we hope that you were blessed with our conversation. Again, thank you, Pastor Jeff, for sitting, sitting down and just answering all the tough questions. And we just hope you have a great rest of your week. And I'll end it like we always do with one hope, one life in Christ. Christ. (laughs) See ya.